Welcome to a CCAI exhibition tour and artist interview. I'm Sharon Ross with Capital City Arts Initiative. Today we are interviewing Colleen Reynolds and she's going to talk about her watercolor paintings in the exhibition Watercolor Stories that's in the Kroll boardroom through the end of June. Um, please come and see the show. Watercolor isn't an easy medium. It is actually quite um, challenging. And, you know, I've worked in a lot of different mediums. I started out actually as an oil painter, was my first painting medium. And um, you can always correct, you know, essentially you can paint over the top of watercolor, or, uh, excuse me, oil and acrylic. But watercolor, you have to plan more. And maybe that's what attracted me to watercolor. So I actually had a wonderful watercolor teacher when I was in college. And I fell in love with the medium ever afterwards. Even though the bulk of my college education was with other media, watercolor attracted me because you had to figure out what you were gonna do ahead of time. And I don't know where that comes from, but I like to have a plan. So in watercolor, because you can't cover it up due to its transparency, the nature of the medium is quite transparent. So you can't just paint over the top of things the history of whatever application of paint that you apply is there for everyone to see. So you have to have a light touch, you have to plan ahead, and you have to preserve those precious whites. So if you see in this painting, there was a lot of white that shows. And in watercolor, there's an interaction between the surface that you're painting upon as well as the paint itself. So it's almost like stained glass. So the light comes through, reflects off the whiteness of the paper and back up through the transparent pigment. So if you cover up the white, you never get that sense of glow back, even if you use white paint or even if you scrape back. So the pres preservation of the white is what makes watercolor so beautiful and so um, luminous is because of the reflection from the light bouncing back through the transparent paint. And that's what makes it challenging, is because you really have to plan for saving the whites, because you can't just pull out a tube of white paint and slap it on, because you're gonna see the difference. So for me, that's what makes it challenging, but it also, if I plan ahead, I have more freedom when I'm actually painting. If you started out in a different medium, like oil or acrylic, you have to think backwards because in oil, you paint the darks first and move back to the whites. Where in watercolor, you paint the darks last. So for me, um, um, yes, it is a big translation. So for me, going bouncing back and forth to different mediums all the time is, a, is the reason I tend to concentrate on watercolor so that I don't have to switch my thinking completely. Brasho is a uh, product I discovered, uh, comes out of England. It's actually a um, crystallized ink. So they have different colors of ink that they've put through some kind of process to turn them into powder. And so they call it watercolor crystals. That's what they actually are. And it's out of England, so they spell it L-O-U-R instead of L-O-R. <laughs> whatever. Um, anyway, so it's a watercolor crystals. So it is a water based medium or a watercolor medium. In other words, you can dissolve it with water, but because it comes in these really intense pigment um, granules, when you spray it with water, it just sort of explodes and um, the color it's almost like fireworks in slow motion. I wish I could capture that in the final painting, that whole explosion thing. So you can see a little bit of that in the painting here, all these little granules just sort of um, explode when you add water to them. But you can also paint with it very much like I would with watercolor itself. The pigment just doesn't have the viscosity um, that watercolor paint has. It has body where this is really, it's almost like tang. Um, 
if you ever had tang back in the olden days. I grew up with tang. That's what the astronauts drank. So uh, anyway, it dissolves very much like that um, drink, if maybe you can relate to that. And then you can just use your brush and paint with that, just like you do with watercolor. So this particular painting, I did a whole series, I think four, this size, uh, a little bit bigger, um, using the brush -o right after I discovered it, just so that I could get um, familiar with the product. And then I started doing some workshops. I was kind of one of the first American artists to use brush -o widespread. And then it's sort of taken off now and they're starting to carry it in all the major watercolors or uh, art supply stores like Cheap Joe's and Brick, Dick Blick now carry it. But when I first started with it, the only way I could get it was to order it direct from the manufacturer in England. Portraits have been one of my favorite subjects. So thank you for considering my portraits accomplished. Um, how do I approach them? I um, approach them very similar to how I would approach any other subject. I start by a good drawing. I want to get a good drawing um, that captures the essence of the individual. So I spend a lot of time in the preparation um, in drawing and redoing the drawing, checking it in the mirror to check for accuracy. And then fortunately with this particular portrait with Mitch, I had the opportunity to do my own photo shoot as well. So the photo shoot to me was critical because I was able to set them up in the environment that I wanted. We had a lot of fun with the um, steam. We actually tried to use dry ice and um, the dry ice just kind of flowed right over the top and went down instead of up. So I had to make up a lot of the steam. But for me, the environment was really set because I was able to do my own photo shoot. So when I get into the actual portrait, I actually did two practice um, watercolor studies before I went into the actual painting. But the drawing to me is critical. That's where I find the likeness. That's where I um, double check, recheck. It's like the foundation of a home. You don't want to go into building the walls before you've got the foundation in place. So I tend to do a lot of um, upfront work so that when I actually get to start letting the paint flow, um, I've already made all my decisions. So that drawing is basically my first date with the, with the portrait. And portraits are complex subjects, but they're no more complex than a flower. They are just, if I don't get it right, people know. So the audience is my test to know it. So if you get the proportions wrong or you don't get a likeness, people are gonna tell you right away. So that's why it has to be really accurate. Once we came up with the theme of the show, that it would be appropriate, since there are stories, to tell what my story was behind the production of the painting. And this one in particular, to me, has a lot of story going on. It's one of my most creative paintings, I have to admit. And I can't even tell you how the genesis of the idea came. I had done the drawing um, probably a month, two months ahead of the painting on a different piece of paper and then I was just going to trace up the drawing to the watercolor paper so I didn't have a lot of extraneous marks. And so I had done the drawing on a 16 by 20 piece of paper and then it didn't fit on this vertical format that I have with the 15 across 22. So I thought, what am I going to do with the top and the bottom? And I thought, well, when they were, when I took the photograph of them, they were sitting on the couch and they were watching Star Trek. And it was kind of their weekly thing, the kitty and he, and he would say, you know, the cat's going to come with me now to um, watch Star Trek. So don't bother us for an hour. So anyway, so I decided to try to incorporate what they were doing with the actual portrait of he and the cat. So I used some very complex triadic 
um, secondary color harmony because I was using it for a class demonstration painting as well. And I just decided to put the planets and the stars and using um, different techniques um, for creating texture that was the lesson in my college class and created the environment. And to me, it's really fun because it looks like he's being absorbed into the image that they're all looking at. And the cat happened to have a really great expression too that she was really absorbed. I don't know how long it lasted, but I did manage to catch it in a photograph. So for me, this is one of my favorite stories. So the Mother series, or the Mother Stories series, is actually what inspired me to come up with this name of this exhibit, um, because I have three of them in the series. This was the first one that I painted. It's not necessarily the first chronologically in the series, but this was the first one I painted. And it was inspired, I was teaching a workshop and I was looking for, on portraits, I was looking through some old black and white photos, because black and white photos actually help, because you see the value instead of the color. But um, I was looking through some old family photos that were in black and white, and I ran across this picture, I'd never seen it before, um, of my mother when she was 17, 18, you know, a young woman, still at the onset of her adulthood, dreaming about becoming a famous writer. and. Um, I looked at her and I thought, holy cow, my mom was hot back in the day. Um, and now people are telling me in my older age that I look like my mother. So that's a good thing, because look at how hot she was back in the 50s. So this was probably about 1950, 1951 time frame. And so I also ran across, my mother since passed, but I ran across a lot of her journaling. She was a voracious, I don't know if that's the right word. She wrote a lot. She just filled up notebook after notebook of uh, journals. And so, and then she wrote some stories as well. And one of her journal pieces was about an experience she had um, in World War II with her parents having to go to a, an area in Indian Valley, Idaho, which is another one of the paintings um, that I call Dreamcatcher in the series. But um, for this one, I took that story about her time in Indian Valley, Idaho, and I wrote that into the background of the painting. So that's superimposed into the background. So I just wrote it out with a pencil and then I masked it with a ruling pen and um, then painted over the top of the painting. So masking fluid is a, is a resist that keeps the watercolor paint from getting down there. It's a bit like rubber cement for those of you that aren't watercolor painters. Um, and so I did that and painted over the top of it and then um, painted everything, did the flower thing because she was supposedly flowering into becoming a famous writer. That was her dream at the, at the time. And then afterwards I took the masking off and I went over it, um, before I took the masking off, sorry, I went over it with the gold paint so that it would stand out a little bit. And I went right across the figure with the gold paint and then remove the masking and that's what you had at the end. So the gold, if you look at it in a certain light, has you know a preciousness to it. That was my idea behind using the metallic paint in it. So the series includes three so far. I might do more. I might change and do a series of my father stories, but this was my mother series, series of three paintings. This one and when she was 10 in Indian Valley and then another one when she was a mother of five children called the Mom Train. And the uh, Mom Train is also in this exhibit. I encourage you to look at that one as well. And that, the, the writing in those um, tell the story of that time. So last year we started this plein air event um, to be concentrated in Carson City. And it was my brainchild along with some a uh, group of students of mine. And we decided this got totally off topic in our workshop and started talking about doing this plein air event. Well, we were looking around for an image that could advertise that. And I had this painting on the rails in my studio. And they said, well, what about that one? So anyway, so this became the iconic image to um, to represent the inaugural plein air event focused on Car Carson City. So that was last year. And this year we're continuing that. So we're gonna have the second annual one. We'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about that event. But this particular painting is up above Western Nevada College of the rabbit blush and bloom about the same time that 
the event was taking place in mid-September. And I just love the rabbit bush. I love the way it smells, especially since it tends to grow next to uh, the sagebrush, which is Nevada through and through. And so this painting was the iconic image for that event. And then while that was going on, it was also accepted to display at the uh, Nevada Museum of Art when they had the Latimer um, tribute, 100 year tribute to Lorenzo Latimer, excuse me, um, exhibit up at the Nevada Museum of Art. Some of the current club members were accepted to do a display there. So this little painting has been in the Nevada Museum of Art as well, and it's sold, as you can see by this little red dot here. And so be sure you contact the uh, Capital City Arts Initiative. Um, their website should be on your screen, but it's ccainv.org. The plein air event, we're calling it um, second annual watercolor plain air in Carson City, Nevada. Um, we're going to have the next, the second annual event will be in the middle of September. I believe the dates are the 15th through the 18th. So it starts on a Thursday. Um, so we'll have three days of plain air where um, the registered artists come in and then go anywhere as long as it's in Carson City County and they go off on their own or with a buddy and um, paint and produce um, watercolor plein air. And then we frame those and put them um, in an exhibit at the governor's mansion, we're hoping is our um, tentative location. That's where it was last year. And this year it'll be on the Sunday from one to four in the afternoon. And we hope buyers from all over Carson City will come and participate in the auction sales event on that day. It's a ticketed event and we're supporting two local charities. Uh, the first charity is Circles Initiative and then we're also um, funding an existing scholarship to the Western Nevada College for a local Carson City um, student. So this is a plein air painting that I did um, for that event last year and I call this um, what did I name it? Backyard wildflower flowers. I painted it in my backyard outside. I have my mask on. Um, during the fires, the smoke that we got that came up into South Tahoe last year. Um, so uh, we've since moved away from the house. So the painting is actually quite special to me now because this is capturing the wildflowers in our backyard. But it was all painted plain air. I took breaks to go in and breathe again inside. And then I go back and paint with my mask and everything out into the smoke. And that's what you see in the background is kind of a hint of the fires. So if you want to know about this plein air event, there's a link to it on my website, which is my name, uh, ColleenReynolds.com. It's on the very home page. You can click the link and I'll tell you all about it, where to go, what to see, and who's participating. Um, so more information if you're a painter it's uh, of watercolor, come on out and join and be a registered artist explains all the details of the event. Colleen, thank you so much. It was a terrific interview. Um, Watercolor Stories is up in the Kroll boardroom through the end of June. You can see it during, attend any public meeting that the city has or on request through CCAI's website, ccainv.org. And the exhibition is funded by CCI members in public and private foundations and they are listed on the following image. Thank you for watching.